Hello, folks. Ben Crawshaw here. I want to say thank you so much for jumping in with us for today's webinar. I appreciate you clearing time out of your very busy schedules. I know you have a lot going on, and uh, I just appreciate you setting apart uh, some of your work day to spend time with us in this webinar. Uh, my name is Ben Crawshaw. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about my role with the Rocket Company in just a little bit, but uh, right now what I want to make sure is that all of our technology is working. So that's one of the great things about uh, a webinar, being able to do it free, being able to provide this webinar for people literally all over the world. Uh, it's through technology, but you guys all know because you all utilize technology that it can be your best friend, work for you, great, and sometimes you just it just doesn't want to work for you at all. So. I want to make sure that you guys can see me, um, you can hear me. Haley Hand is joining me today on the webinar. So Haley, can you see, can you see me, can you hear me? Hey Ben, we're good to go. All right, great. So uh, again, thank you for jumping in wherever you're from. Uh, we have a chat stream. I, I, you know, you look around your screen, you can locate chat. I believe it says that. There's a way that you can log in. Some of you have logged in before. I would love for you to jump in that chat stream and just let us know where you're from. And that'll let us know also that you can see, you can hear everything clearly. Technology is working for you. I love it when technology works for us, but it can be oh so maddening when it doesn't. Um, so sometimes if, if, if there's a little delay or there's a little pause, you can refresh your browser. Uh, you may have you know, some spotty internet where you're at and it may be an issue of internet on your side. Things seem to be working well on our end, at least right now, so hopefully it'll continue to work for you. So jump in the chat stream and just let us know where you're from. And what we wanna do with that chat stream throughout this webinar is give you an opportunity to type in some questions. Again, we love this being a, um, a dialogue, not a monologue, so if someone else types in a question and you've, you've really uh, worked through that and your church staff recently, you feel free to jump in and answer that. Russell's gonna be in the chat stream working through as many uh, questions as he can. Haley's gonna you know, take some of those questions and read them out loud and we're gonna talk about them together. But again, feel free to jump in the chat stream, type in some questions or you know, have some conversations with some other people who are in there. And you know, we're all church leaders who are doing the best that we can to journey, you know, through all kinds of stuff, volunteers, you know, recruiting volunteers, worship, you know, children's ministry, and as we're going to talk about today, child safety. So I really hope that we can be advocates and cheerleaders for each other as we do this today. So Haley, anybody uh, jump in that chat stream and say where they're from? Hey Ben, we've got people from all over. Um, so let's see, right now I can see Leonard from California. We've got Craig coming in from Georgia. Marvin from Ontario, so we have Canada representing. Yep, nice. Um, scrolling through here, we've got some Las Vegas, um, Ohio, West Virginia, New Jersey, Maryland, Trinidad. So that might have the um, the vote for the longest, the farthest away right now. Um, yep. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana. So people from all over. That's awesome. I was in Pennsylvania a couple of weekends ago, and I loved it. So love that state. That was awesome. Um, okay, now if you're just joining us again, we're, we're uh, Haley was just reading out some of the names and locations in the chat stream, and I want to encourage you to jump in there and type in some questions as much as you can um, over the next hour. I would love for you to try to focus in. If you can put your you know phone on silent, I know for for many of you that may not be an option because you got a lot going on, people trying to contact you right now. But if it is possible, uh, where you can really focus in as much as you can, I would love. For you to do that and again just want to let you know russell is going to be in the chat stream he's a member of our team and he's going to be getting to as many questions as he can and also haley is going to be taking some of those questions and reading them out loud uh, so that we can discuss those things together so we may not get to every question but we're going to get to as many as we can if we don't get to your question don't get frustrated with us uh, you can always shoot us an email and we'll try to come back around when we have you know, more time to process and make sure we're given uh, you know, due diligence to your question and answering it in the most responsible way that we know based on our knowledge and our resources. So again, I appreciate it. Um, in just a minute here, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm gonna go off camera and I'm gonna share my screen so that you guys can track along with my slides. 
just a little warning, I, I get prone to get excited and talk fast. So if I'm blazing through it a little too fast, um, you can try to get in that chat stream and say, hey, I missed that point. Maybe somebody else will jump in there. Or again, you shoot us an email and we'll send you some slides on the back end to make sure you have plenty of time to process. Maybe we can send them as a PDF or something like that. So I'm gonna share my screen here in just a second. Um, hold on, let me, uh, let me take myself off camera there. I'm gonna share my screen. And let's see here, Haley, you just let me know um, if and when you can see my screen. Everything working? Hey Ben, looks good. Okay, great. So um, again, you guys jump in that chat stream at any time and any questions that you have, any discussion, Russell, Haley will be there. Um, I just appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule um, to join us for today's webinar. We're calling this the Church Safety Summit. There is so much stuff that we can talk about um, that it would be impossible. We're talking days and days of content and conversations. Um, as I began doing a lot of research on some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, I realized, number one, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, there's a lot of new information based on, uh, unfortunately, churches that have gone through you know, difficult situations from a safety standpoint or a legal standpoint. But I found that a lot of the information, it was segmented, it was uh, a little bit confusing or overwhelming, it was in a lot of different places. And so I've worked really hard over the last six months to get this information into one place, to curate it, compile it, and get it into a place and make it as easy as possible, not just to understand, but to implement. So I wanna make it clear that today, um, I'm going to just be touching on some highlights of some of the things that I've learned in my research, but mainly in conversations with people who know a lot more than me. Um, but I just want you to know there's a lot more that we could talk about. This is such a big topic, um, but we're going to, you know, have a good time today and, and share information and gather as much as we can and learn as much as we can. My name is Ben Crawshaw. Uh, I, I work with content at The Rocket Company, and really what I do there is just learn from you. Church leaders who are in the trenches week after week, sharing ideas with each other, best practices, bringing that together, and helping churches you know, get just a little bit further down the field. Uh, I started in ministry in 1998. There you see my family. I have two daughters, Lila and Esme. I love small churches. Uh, my dad's a pastor of a small church. My first job was at a small church. And I love big churches too, although we all have different definitions of, you know, what represents a small church or a big church. Um, but I'm, a, you know, a big fan because I understand all the different hats that um, staff members at small churches have to wear, how many volunteers need to be utilized. But I love the heartbeat around small churches and what you're doing and really love providing resources that sometimes the big churches have access to that small churches don't, um, you know, being able to implement those things quickly utilizing volunteers. And I'm passionate about helping churches and making a difference. Now, my goal today is to turn hard to understand into easy to implement. And I'm not saying I'm gonna hit that goal perfectly, but I just want to let you know that's my aim today. That's what I'm hoping for, is that this stuff, which seems so overwhelming, or at least did to me, you're gonna walk away with a couple of points that are gonna be easy for you to implement. Now, if you stay until the end, I'm gonna share some great procedures to put in place around your church. Now here's what I believe makes today different, is I'm gonna talk practically, not philosophically. And what I mean by that is, I'm not going to drone on and on about the state of the church, about you know, all of society and all of the um, you know, potential harms and risks that society could bring to our church, where our church sits you know, in the safety subject. I'm gonna talk practically uh, for you guys about some things you at least need to think about, or think about putting in to practice. So it's real practical um, and hopefully really, really helpful to you. Now, I think that the topic of church safety is overwhelming. And as I already told you, I did a lot of research, looked at a lot of places and realized there's some great stuff, but it was segmented and it was just a lot to take in. It was just a lot to digest. Um, and I used to think about it a lot as a church leader, uh, but I didn't do anything. And I, it was because I didn't know what to do. So it would like keep me up at night. You're thinking about child safety, worried about facilities, thinking through insurance policies, 
you know, what happens if we need to fire someone? I just didn't do anything because I didn't know. I really didn't know where to start. And if I did know where to start, I didn't know where to go from there. I, it was really just a totally um, just exhausting, overwhelming topic to me. It's like hearing a weird sound when you start your car, you know, and you're driving down the road and it's just making all these funny noises. So what most of us do is we ignore it and just hope it goes away. And that's what I would do with all these like anxieties and fears I had when it came around church safety. When I would hear about things that co could go wrong, I would just ignore it, hope it goes away. And I used to read or hear about stuff that happened at other churches. And again, when I started, there wasn't as, as much stuff and you know, it wasn't as much in the media or, you know, people reporting on it. Um, but when I would hear about stuff, I would think, you know, it'll never happen to me. God will protect my church. And I'm not even sure where I'd start anyway, as I already mentioned. Um, and you know what? You as church leaders, you, you have a lot of other things to focus on, right? It, it's not like as a church leader, you wake up and it's most natural for you to think first and foremost about church safety. I mean, sermons, their staff development, pastoral counseling, you got to recruit volunteers. You know, you want to empower, enable, support your missionaries. You want to disciple the people, you know, that God has brought into your congregation. You want to provide addiction recovery. You want to do some things in the community, family ministry. Um, there's a lot going on. So here's what I've discovered. Church safety is a spiritual issue. So all of these things we mentioned up here, yeah, these are all spiritual issues. Well, so, so is church safety. It, it's a spiritual issue as well. As a church leader, I am and you are to shepherd my congregation and staff in as many ways as I possibly can, including making sure they're protected, the facilities are protected, we have proper insurance, that we, you know, even if we have to let someone go, we handle that procedure in a way that is respectful to them as human beings, that we treat them with value and worth because that's what Jesus modeled for us. That's what Jesus demonstrated for us in the way that he treated people. So even if, unfortunately, we have to part ways with an employee based either on their performance or budget cuts, we still want to do it in an ethical, moral, responsible way and in a way that shows respect to people. And also, I've discovered that my church is not above the law or good business practices. And I don't say I don't think that churches consciously take this stance that we're outside of the law or, you know, when it comes to things like discrimination or, you know, we'll talk about background checks in a little bit that, hey, we're a church, we're a religious organization or a nonprofit. We have the right. Well, we do have some rights um, to make some decisions based on the fact that we are a religious organization. But there's also so many things uh, that legally we have to comply with and, you know, that we have to be responsible for. We're not above the law uh, by any means. And it, it's very rare that, you know, there's a lawsuit, you know, against a church leader or church leadership based on hiring, firing, based on something that happens in the church, but it happens and it could happen and it's happening more. And so we just want to talk about it. Uh, in, in, you know, working through some of the content that we're talking about and then some more products that we're going to talk about later, I've met with pastors, HR directors, human resource directors, lawyers, insurance agents, just to name a few. Met with a lot of people, had a lot of conversations, asked a lot of questions, did a lot of research. So by no means am I establishing myself as the person who knows all of this. I'm the person who has compiled it from people who are smarter than me and done research to verify what they're talking about. And the reason why I met with all them is because I wanted to give you tangible steps in a complicated arena of ministry. I have about 50 insights I could share, but for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on five. I'm just going to focus on five today. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is going to be to just track along with me for the five things that we talk about today, knowing that there could be a lot more, that there's so many other insights, so many other areas of conversation that we could focus on, and we're going to have some breaks for Q&A as well. So number one is this, utilize background checks. Utilize background checks. So for staff members that you hire, for key volunteers, you want to do a background check um, to make sure that you're not putting someone into a key position in ministry when you haven't done thorough research to know their background. And, I, and I'm not trying to say that people are liars. A lot of times people um, in those types of positions, you know, they have the approach in their heart or in their mind that, you know, 
well, God has healed me um, or God has changed a lot of my life. That was in the past. And so they won't share that information as part of a staff interview or a key volunteer interview. Uh, so you want to do thorough research and you certainly don't want to you know, compromise any positions of your ministry. Um, you know, a very obvious example would be someone who's a key volunteer um, in your children's ministry uh, that has been a registered sex offender in the past. And background checks is going to reveal that type of information and, um, you know, th which will lead to conversations and decisions that you can make that protect your church and protect your ministry. So there are federal laws that you uh, have to comply with when you do this. Um, your obligations, the things that you have to um, have to do, the, uh, the, the kind of communication and research that you need to do, and then their rights. So even as you do background checks with people, um, once they give you permission, they still have rights and you want to know those. I suggest that you use a company that screens ac across several checkpoints. And I'm going to say at a minimum, these, the National Criminal Database Search, National Sex Offender Registry Search, uh, Social Security Number Verification, and Address History Trace. This is at bare minimum. Um, and Protect My Ministry, done a lot of work with them and we've partnered with them on, on some products is a great company. I, I just think so thorough in what they do, so experienced when it comes to working with churches and providing the services of background checks for them. I highly suggest you check them out and their services take a very overwhelming and you know kind of confusing process and working with a company who's done it and does it very well and has been doing it for a long time and they will walk you through it and uh, make it as seamless as possible for you but also making sure you have all the information that you need and making sure that you comply with federal law so you don't have any missteps as you do these background checks. Number two, I suggest that you find an experienced church lawyer who you can run things by. So what I would do, if you can't think of anybody right now, is ask around to some of the churches in your community. And even if you don't have relationships with them, you can just call up to the, you know, the front office and ask to speak with any member of the staff and just say, hey, um, do you guys know of a lawyer who has some experience working with churches, who understands kind of the unique uh, spot that churches and nonprofits sit in, uh, who could be a valuable research, uh, resource for you? And having an experienced church lawyer um, that you can run things by, even if you pay them a little bit, um, you know, each time you meet together, you work that out, it's worth the money because so many things that you're just like, I'm unsure. Wouldn't it be great to have somebody who understands the law, understands it specifically as a church, and you could just call them up and say, hey, I want to run something by you. And, um, you know, are, are we handling ourselves in a proper way here? Are we doing this correctly? Is there something that needs to change? Is there anything that could put us at risk here? I just want to have a conversation with you about that. And I've seen churches that they know people or maybe there's a lawyer that's in the congregation who said, yeah, you know, you just give me a call if you have any questions. Or again, they found another lawyer and they pay them a little bit of money just to be a resource for them that you can ask questions. Uh, I just suggest that is a great practice that you could put in place immediately. Um, and, and one of the, you know, some of the things that they, you may want them to look at would be like your hiring process. You want to document it. So you literally want to um, write out how the hiring process works. Potential candidates, you want to let them see that. Everything that you can document in, in the uh, you know, potential hiring, the hiring and the firing process, documentation is key. Document your hiring process. What it looks like as you interview, you want to document that. Um, it, it, as you, you know, make decisions about whether you're going to go to the next round of interviews and who they're going to meet with next, you want everything to be documented. Create an employee handbook. Now, this is huge, and I think um, there, there are so many churches that don't take the time to do this. An employee handbook, it, it's so helpful for you um, when it comes to, number one, setting expectations and guidelines for your staff members. Um, it really kind of helps you figure out really what you want the, you know, the rules to be and the regulations for your employees, which is great. People want to know. You know they, if, they're, if they're playing a, a game, they want to know what the rules are, what the boundaries are. Um, and it also helps you, unfortunately, if there is a situation where someone needs to be let go. By the way, going back up to the hiring process, you know, as a religious 
organization, you are permitted, you know, to not hire someone on the basis of religious differences, obviously. However, uh, a great practice for you would be to clearly write down what you believe. So to clearly state what your church believes so that if someone doesn't adhere to that, even if they are a Christian, um, then, then it's documented that you gave them some evidence of what you believe. Um, they made it clear that there's some differences of preference or stance on some things, and you saw that as the purpose for not hiring them. That keeps you out of legal trouble, the documentation there. Again, back to the employee handbook, um, and then you want to start today with em employee performance reviews. So I suggest, you know, quarterly, there's employee performance reviews. Now, he here's why this is so helpful for you when it comes to the unfortunate, you know, potentially having to fire someone process. Now, let's say um, it, you're, you're firing someone based on poor performance, and you have the right to do that. Um, but if you have, first off, a handbook that states, you know, that we work a certain number of hours a week or that we expect, you know, employees as best as they can, you know, get to work on time, understanding that there will be, you know, some unique situations or they'll have to let us know that, you know, they, they didn't make it. But if you have an employee performance review, and you sit down with somebody, and again, this is documented, and you say, hey, I've noticed that almost every staff meeting, you're late. That, um, you know, when it comes to getting to church on Sunday morning, you're always late. And I just want us to talk through a probation period to see if we can get this corrected. And I want to make it clear that I've seen enough of this um, tardiness that, you know, over, I believe, a 90-day period is a great probation period, that if it's not corrected at the end of 90 days, we may have to make a decision to let you go. And you, you state that on the front. And then, you know, over those 90 days, then, you know, you see if they're correcting or if it gets worse or they continue to be late. And if it's just they're, they're late, it's detrimental to the work that they're doing um, and you let them go. Well, number one, it's in the employee handbook, which they saw. And, I, you know, I think it could be great for them to sign or to sign a document that said they read the employee handbook. Then the, the performance reviews have been documented that you were putting them on a probation period based on tardiness and that you made it clear to them as you put them on that probation period that you may have to let them go. And, it, you know, over the 90 days. It did not improve. It did not get better. So you're letting them go on that basis. And then there's something that uh, I believe they should sign. We'll, that, that's another conversation for another time. But at this point, you're, you're not in legal trouble at all. There's really, you know, hardly any chance there will be recourse against you based on letting someone go. And they can't claim that, oh, this was unfair. Oh, you know, you're making stuff up. No, it's all been documented. And then document your firing process. This is in a way that points back to your employee handbook and performance reviews. So the hiring process, the handbook, the performance reviews, and then the firing process are all things that you could have a lawyer take a look at and just say, hey, I would love for you to look through these really quick. You don't have to nitpick, but if you see any red flags, will you please let me know because we're drafting some of these up for the first time and we know they need to be edited and improved, but I would just like for you to take a look. Hey, you can even Google search. Um, church employee handbooks and you know you can find little bits and pieces there's a lot of examples up there of stuff that you like stuff that you don't like and begin piecing yours together so Haley I just said a lot we're gonna jump in with some Q&A and anybody in there have some questions they want to talk about hey Ben yeah we've had a lot of great questions coming in um, so you guys keep sending them if we don't get them get to them in this Q&A session we'll get to them in the next one that we'll have in a few minutes. So the first few questions are relating to background checks. And Mo just asked for some clarification. Um, are you saying that every single person who serves in the church needs a background check? I believe so, yes. I think that if you're gonna have a volunteer who represents your church to visitors, represents your church to congregation members, um, then you wanna do a background check to make sure that there's nothing uh, substantial in there that could serve as a red flag or could potential put your, uh, potentially put your people in danger. Um, if I was a pastor of a church right now, it would be commonplace uh, for everybody who's going to be a volunteer to go through a background check. And I think this day and age, it's not shocking to people. Uh, people are aware of, you know, the, 
the threats out there. It's, you know, we don't live in a day and age like we used to where our kids could just ride their bikes into town. Um, people are aware uh, that, you know, you want to make sure, especially the next generation is protected. And if I think if anything, it'll create some respect from your volunteers, knowing that you're working that diligently to make sure it's a place where people, especially kids are protected. Great. And how often would you say those background checks should be rerun? You know, I think uh, stand, industry standard is about two years. I would say two to three years would be a great amount of time to, uh, to, do, to do that. Okay. And this is from David. He asked, can you repeat the name of the database that you recommended to do the background checks? Yes, it's Protect My Ministry. So protectmyministry.com. And you can just Google, open a separate tab and Google Protect My Ministry, and it should take you. They should probably be the first, uh, you know, result in the search right there, and you can click on it. There should be some, you know, spots in there where you can fill out some information. You're not committing to anything. You're just getting some more information from them, finding out more about what they're, what they're all about. But they do an incredible job. And the church I go to, North Point Community Church, which has over, you know, 40,000 members, it – you know, my church uses Protect My Ministry for its background check services and has been very pleased with the work that they've done. Great. Um, what do you think is the biggest church hazard that most churches aren't aware of at this time? Well, ironically, I think one of the big church hazards right now is not having um, automobile insurance, commercial auto insurance. Uh, that's a huge liability in doing research is, you know, if you have a church ban or if you're going on church functions and you have church uh, leadership driving, you know, multiple people, uh, there's just so many scenarios, unfortunately, where if something happened, it could really turn into some hot water for your church staff. And I don't say this to be, you know, pessimistic and doomsday, just part of doing the research for, uh, you know, things like this webinar today and a lot of the content that we've been putting together recently um, just found that surprising that that was one of the big, you know, red flags out there. Um, certainly also what I talked about at the beginning, um, the background check uh, information and churches that are, you know, slow to adopt that process are typically churches that are smaller, maybe in rural settings. I think about my parents' church but such easy access for people to get in there and for something to happen. And, uh, you know, I've had conversations with churches about, listen, uh, you, you feel so comfortable on Sundays that uh, people coming up and, you know, picking up babies, it, it just doesn't have a, a lot of safety to it. And I recognize that, you know, this is just a small church and everybody loves each other, but, um, it could be really easy for someone uh, to step into a church and, you know, for something to happen. And, you know, what we say, better safe than sorry. You know, better people be kind of frustrated with you because especially drop off and pick up policies of your children's ministry and preschool area for it to seem too strict than for it to seem too lackadaisical or too comfortable. Um, you just want to make sure you're being very thorough in those situations. It's a great question. Awesome. We've got one more right now, Ben. Um, and this is one that if you use this in your church, feel free to, in the chat stream, share your thoughts. But Leonard and Jim asked, um, what do you recommend as a policy for church staff having firearms on campus? Well, that's a great question. And we, you know, uh, we're not going to get to that in, the, in this uh, webinar. You know, talk through having a really what we call a church shooter or a church violence procedure in place. So I suggest one of two things, and it's not going to directly answer your question. I apologize for that. Uh, number one would be to have a, um, a plainclothes officer that you hire anytime you have, uh, you know, corporate worship services. So let's say Wednesday night and Sunday morning is when your church meets. And so, you know, this would be an expense that comes from your church that, you know, during those periods of time, there would be a plain clothes officer who would obviously be armed, um, but, you know, wouldn't be in full police gear, obviously just wearing street clothes. Or you could have a security team and you could have two people that are there and or it's a rotating thing with people that you completely trust 
and they're there and, and they kind of peruse the grounds, uh, but they also, you know, maybe have access to the two-way radio or a walkie-talkie. Whether or not you want them to be armed is your choice. It's totally up to you. And part of it is, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, make the statement whether you should or shouldn't, um, you know, coming from me. I believe that if I were a pastor right now, then I would say yes, that at least one of them is. Uh, so that if, um, you know, there is a violent uh, intruder who enters into uh, our church, which, you know, we've seen it and it's, you know, now more of a threat than ever, um, then there is somebody there who is armed, who's been prepared and we've had a conversation and they understand that this is, you know, there could be a situation that goes down Problem chances are so good that there's not, but if there is, then we're ready. It's a great question, and I, I imagine that's going to, uh, you know, create some interesting conversation in the chat stream, which I love. All right, Haley, we'll have another Q and A in a minute. I'm going to keep rolling for right now. We're going to get to point number three: get a third party walkthrough of your facilities. So, uh, you know, this could be, you know, an insurance agent, a, li a liability specialist, police officer. It could just be a volunteer who, um, you know, is great with construction and has a good eye for things that uh, could represent a hazard. And you want to do a walkthrough and keep a running list of the top three things that need to be addressed. Top three things. So you want to look for the things that um, represent the biggest, uh, you know, risks right now and can be addressed the quickest. If you try to list out every single thing that needs to be fixed, every place where someone could, you know, potentially slip, um, you know, every, uh, you know, it's just going to be overwhelming. Um, but just doing the top three things is also going to help you do these continual walkthroughs. And it could be two staff members. You want to go through your entire church facility and you want to look for different areas that could represent, okay, that's a place where someone could slip and fall. That's a sharp object. That looks like that could be an electrical risk. Maybe we'll get an electrician up here to let us know if everything's safe right there. Making, making sure like if there's an area that kids have access to, that the, the, you know, the cabinets are locked, if there are cleaning you know, products in there. It really is a lot like your house. Um, for those of you who have young kids, for those of you who have guests coming over, you obviously want your home to be a safe place for your family and for guests. Um, your church facility is the same way. Walking through your handicap accessibility, getting into, the, into um, your main sanctuary and also into the bathroom. You also could have an officer who comes through and looks at it from a standpoint of a potential, um, you know, robbery, looks at your lighting, uh, shrubbery. You don't want to have shrubbery that's too close to the building that someone could hide behind easily. Um, just these walkthroughs are so helpful for you when you're with someone who sees it with fresh eyes or is, is coming in with critical eyes. So, you know, maybe you have a, a, a someone who's a contractor, a construction contractor at your church and they're there every week. Well, every week when they show up, they're not looking around for safety hazards. They're bringing their kids and showing up and they're happy to be there. Um, but if they come in on Tuesday and you guys do a walkthrough and they're looking at it with a critical eye, they're gonna hopefully help you spot some things that could represent a potential situation. Uh, establishing church volunteer work days. These are incredible because you may have someone who could take ownership of your facilities, not just from a standpoint of safety, but overall of your facilities and establish some church volunteer work days where you could do a bunch of walkthroughs. You could compile a longer list and then you have, you know, people who come up, men and women who come up to the church on a Saturday and for a couple hours, you knock out a lot of that stuff. And again, um, the, the more of this that you can educate people on saying, hey, we really want to work hard to make sure our facilities are safe, that they're safe for people who come through, elderly people, that our kids are safe, that it's safe from a standpoint of, uh, you know, we don't pose a real easy entry point for, you know, people who come in off the streets or people who, uh, you know, come in and, and you know, want to grab some stuff that, you know, we leave out. Um, people leave valuables at the church all the time. Uh, having people, you know, help you think through that, um, the more, the better. And the more people are, you know, aware of the fact that we want this church to be a really safe place, the better. In volunteer work days, you can knock a lot of that out. And then create a church usage agreement. Now, this is going to vary so much uh, from person to person who's listening to this. Um, but 
uh, you know, your church may host a lot of things that happen, a lot of weddings. There may be, you know, graduations. There may be, uh, you know, other Bible studies or community groups that meet, uh, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. You may have addiction recovery groups that meet. There may be, you know, basketball leagues that happen in your gymnasium. There's all kinds of stuff. And it's great. The church, you know, we want to be a place um, that is a hub of the community. But you also want to create a usage agreement. And this um, is something that kind of walks through the space that they're going to use. It walks through kind of your rules and guidelines and then making sure that, um, you know, you release yourself from liability if, if something happens. So if there's a basketball league that meets in your gym and, you know, someone falls, breaks their arm, then that based on that usage agreement, um, you're not liable for that. Um, and, it's, you know, it's just part of keeping yourself protected based on what's happening there. You know, there's so much more that we could talk about from a facility standpoint um, as far as, you know, exterior lighting, as far as having people who, um, you know, just do a drive by once a week just to check on uh, the way you lock the doors, who has keys. We just don't have time to get to all of this today. But the, the top, the running list of the top three things based on walkthroughs that you do with second party people, that's a great practical step for you right now. And if you can engineer some volunteer work days to, to knock out bigger lists, uh, you're going to go a long way ensuring that your facilities or a safe, safe place. Again, you could look up church usage agreements. You could um, Google search those, work, you know, look through a bunch of different ones to find one that, that you really like, really works for you. You feel like it's simplistic enough for people to understand, but also protects your church and um, do some modifications. And I think uh, you would, you know, be really happy and feel great that you had that as a church staff as something to give to outside parties who use your church facilities for various events. Now, number four, don't try to tackle child safety by yourself. It's too much. There's too much to think about. There's too much to do. Um, you need multiple volunteers or staff members thinking about this. You, you really, as a team, um, you know, moms, uh, you know, uh, again, third party people in the community, you really want to work hard together to get as many uh, policies and procedures, documents, trainings in place in your children's ministry area, knowing that, hey, you can edit those as you go down the road. Like you can make some improvements and changes and you can fix things and clean things up. But something is better than nothing when it comes to preparing volunteers, especially for all the potential situations in your children's ministry. Uh, we've created a product called Safety Rocket. I'll talk to you about that in a minute, but child module four is all about child safety. And we're gonna give you 20 ready to use documents when you jump in. There's a fire evacuation, weather emergency, missing child procedures, suspicious person, power outage, the check-in and check-out policy that's so huge, a parent responsibility policy, a wellness policy, parent custody policy. So I became aware of situation where there was parents going through a divorce, the dad had lost custody um, and was trying to uh, go pick up his son uh, at the end of the church service. And the volunteers became aware of the fact that he had lost custodial uh, or parental rights. So he no longer had custody and all of a sudden realized, man, that's a real thing that could happen. Uh, so we've created that parent custody policy Based on a lot of what we learned through that situation, a media release form, this is for brochures, videos, you know, using pictures or videos that have parents' children in them, allergy guardrails, the diaper to potty guardrails, how you handle that, what do you do when it comes to uh, male volunteers in your children's ministry and taking toddlers to the bathroom, uh, the policies there, discipline guardrails, cleanliness, handicapped and special needs, security stickers, an interview guide, this is for volunteers, teacher position description, ministry team commitment, and child abuse education. That's a lot right there, all provided in module four of Safety Rocket that we'll talk to you about in a minute. But if you, when you look at this screen right here, you can understand why I said don't try to tackle this alone. This is so much, um, but it's so important. Um, if you look to the top right when it comes to allergy guardrails, you don't want to uh, find yourself in a position where you take a misstep and you give goldfish to someone who's 
allergic to wheat or, um, you know, there's, uh, you're, you're handing out something uh, that, you know, peanuts and there's someone with a peanut allergy. You guys know the way allergies work and they're so much more powerful than some kids than others, but you need to have guardrails and a procedure that makes sure that you're protected and your volunteers who, you know, are, I'm sure at the top of their game most Sundays, but sometimes, you know, they're a little sleepy, not completely paying attention or feeling overwhelmed by the kids. And sometimes that's when things can happen. You just want to make sure that you're guarded. All right, Haley, let's jump in with some more Q&A. All right, Ben, great content so far. Um, Lewis wants to know if you're a church that has limited cash flow and you maybe can't afford to pay for all the background checks, what else should you do? Um, I would look for me personally is I would look for someone who could um, that you could explain to them or even, you know, show them this webinar, explain to them the importance of it. Someone who, you know, maybe has a little bit of funding and just say, hey, will you consider um, this as part of your tithe is covering these background checks? I really don't think that there's a way to do them. I, I would not try. I would use the services of a company um, that is experienced in this regard. And there, there's probably going to be varying, you know, degrees of price plans and they'll work with you. Um, but I would just look to fundraise this in some way, shape or form or go to, uh, you know, a donor who may have a little bit of resources and ask them if they could see this as part of their tithe is helping you make sure that uh, your church is safe and your children are safe uh, based on these background checks. But currently I don't really see a great option outside of, uh, you know, spending a little bit of money um, to make sure that you're doing this correctly. And I'm sorry, I wish I had better news for you than that. <laughs> Haley, what's next? All right, Ben, we've got one more right now. This is from Michelle. She asked, um, do you have a recommendation for where a children's ministry should be located on campus for safety reasons? That is a great question, and I think that you do want to be as close to a exit, a parking lot exit, as possible. So, you you know, you think about a fire, and you know, you're in a um, a room with uh, with babies or crawlers. You know, getting all of them into uh, the cribs that you roll out into the parking lot. Um, that's a little bit of a, you know, more time consuming procedure than let's say your student ministry where people can, you know, run or, you know, hopefully in a controlled way, get out to the parking lot. So you want them, you know, uh, your volunteers to be able to get those babies and crawlers into the crib. And from the moment they start rolling them out of the room, they can be in the parking lot as quickly as possible. So I would really look to have your, your children's ministry as close to the parking lot as possible. Um, I strongly suggest that you, um, you know, look for blackout curtains so that if there is evidence or, you know, potential warning of an intruder, um, that you can close out those curtains so that uh, a violent intruder cannot see through the window into your children's ministry or preschool area. Um, so in that instance, you know, I know it feels like, oh, well, you don't want them as close to the edge, but I think some of your internal um, you know, dangers uh, like, you know, a fire breaking out uh, or anything else that would want you to get kids out into the parking lot into some designated zones where their parents could come and check them out as usual, um, the better. And if you can set up your children's ministry in an area in a way that you can lock it down, absolutely, absolutely lock it down. And this keeps it from being a place where someone could walk in off the streets 30 minutes after your service started and roam their way directly into your, your children's ministry area. This also allows you, if there is a shooter on your church property, then you have a lockdown zone where your you know, preschool area and your children's ministry area need to be your most secure lockdown zone. So that if you, you hear that there's a shooter moving towards the main sanctuary, then you can lock both of those places down. No one can get in or get out unless specified uh, through, you know, the two-way radio communication that you have. But um, that's a really, really good question. Um, but yes, you want to think in terms of, especially if a fire breaks out, we want to get these kids out into the parking lot as quickly as we possibly can. Hey, so you guys have asked some really incredible questions. We're going to uh, 
try to have some time here at the end for some more Q&A. Um, but I got to jump into number five here, and that's to know your insurance options. And we don't have time to cover this uh, in, in a lot of detail right now uh, because there's just a lot to talk about. But you want to think through your activities. What happens on your church property? Are you a church that takes a lot of trips? Are you a church that has a church van um, and you have a student pastor who drives you know, his students to summer camp? Think through your activities. You know, do you have a gymnasium where you have basketball leagues that happen? Um, calculate your risk. Okay, so based on our activities, what are some things that could go wrong? Um, and then talk to an agent. Okay, here's our activities. This is what I identified as you know, places where things could potentially go wrong. Um, and then you want to talk to an insurance agent. Again, if you can find some research to talk to an agent who has experience working with churches, all the better. And you want to you know, find someone who's not trying to sell you, they're trying to help you. And if you can find an agent who says to you, hey, I don't think you need that policy right now, then you found one who's going to be honest with you. And that's incredible. But here's some of the best insurance policies, I believe, that are out there for churches right now. Uh, commercial property, crime insurance, general liability, that, that's great. Automobile insurance, we've talked about that earlier. Um, man, so important. Commercial auto insurance, a lot of churches don't utilize this and, and could find themselves in hot water. Umbrella insurance, workers comp, that's pretty much required for everybody anyway. Cybersecurity, now if you um, are collecting a lot of information um, electronically, your, your digital database, if you're, you know, uh, people are giving bank information online, cybersecurity is a new insurance, but it, um, you know, sometimes it, there are things that happen that get outside of general liability insurance uh, that cybersecurity steps up, um, and and many people believe there come a time in the not too you know distant future where cybersecurity uh, will just be you know kind of expected of everybody, and then professional liability, and this has to do with uh, potential malpractice from pastoral counseling, uh, things that could happen with your staff. So Haley, any questions uh, since our last Q and A? We haven't had any more come in right now, Ben, but you guys send them on in if you have any. Okay, great. We'll try to jump in and get to some of those at the end. I, I, I said that I was going to share five procedures with you at the end as well, but I first want to ask you a question, and it's this. Would you like to protect the people who come to your church week after week? Of course you would. The answer for all of that, uh, all of us, is yes. The past hour, we've covered a lot. There is so much more to talk about. I mean, we talked about five things. We could have talked about 50. We could have talked about 500. Even if we had all day, we couldn't cover everything. Um, as it pertains to a topic so heavy and so important as church safety. Uh, you need more than just this training, this training where I just flew through these points. You need resources, resources for you, your team, your staff, your volunteer. You go back to the children's ministry, uh, child safety that we talked about. Think about all those resources for you, your children's ministry leadership team, the, all the volunteers that come through there. Um, it's more than just a training. It's resources education and information and that's why i'm excited to talk to you about safety rocket we're unrolling safety rocket for the first time and we have spent six months just working with all the people uh, that i talked about at the beginning uh, working so hard to compile and curate information for you um, and provided in the six month coaching program uh, coaching resource information application program called safety rocket safety rocket is a powerful online resource that compiles curates and clearly explains some of the vital information your church needs to be protected. We go through information, there's education where you learn uh, you know about things like some of the federal laws when it comes to doing background checks, you you know you get educated on some of the insurance options, the list goes on and on application. Uh, what does this look like in your church and operation? Uh, how could you pull this off quickly uh, with limited staff and with limited budget. Safety Rocket addresses questions like these. How do you do volunteer background checks properly, thoroughly, and legally? How do you fire a staff member ethically, respectfully, and legally? Does your church staff know where fire extinguishers are located and how to operate them? How should children's ministry volunteers handle toddlers who need to go potty? Are you covered if your student pastor gets in a wreck in your church van? What do you do if a shooter enters your church? And about 200 more questions like these addressing as much as we can, but still making it simple, easy to implement, easy to understand. 
More questions. How many churches are ready if a congregation member sues a staff member for malpractice as a result of their pastoral counseling? This is real. It, it happens. It's happening right now. And I don't want to list specific churches because they may be in your area. And I don't want to call you know any situation out, but it's happening as we speak. How many churches have an employee handbook? How many churches have a written plan for what to do if a suspicious person enters their children's ministry area? And I'm not talking about a shooter who has a gun. I'm just talking about a suspicious person. We're not sure if they have ill intent or not. In creating this product, I met with North Point Community Church, a church with over 450 people on staff, and I also thought about my dad's church, which has 125 total members. I wanted a product that would be great for both, for big churches, for small churches. And when I met with North Point, um, they were talking about some of the questions that, that you know, are asked to them. They're just like, there's not really a resource that uh, covers a broad range of things that church leaders need to know and need to have in place when it comes to making sure that their church is protected, um, their staff, their congregation, their facilities, people from the community. Here's what you're going to get when you jump in today. Module one is all about background checks, how to do it, how to comply with federal laws, what you need, your, uh, your obligations, their rights, human resources, talking through the hiring uh, employee handbook, firing process, facilities. We're going to walk all through facilities and what you need to know as far as making sure you've thought through everything and you're protected. Child safety, which includes those 20 documents. Module one includes a ton of documents that are already done for you. Module five is insurance, explaining your options and what each insurance uh, you know policy provides, and then safety procedures. Module six is all about, um, you know, lockdown policies, a church violence plan, handling money. We're going to talk about things like that. Here's the total value of that. But we want to reward people who jump in quickly. And that's why we're excited to have the fast action bonus today, which is the volunteer recruitment and development system. And listen, we understand that at almost every church, but especially you small church leaders out there, you don't have the staff member to even think about uh, all the stuff that we've talked about. You're utilizing volunteers for everything, and you can utilize volunteers uh, for, for your church safety as well and take them through Safety Rocket or give different modules to different people based on the area where they volunteer or their key leaders or, you know, their leaders to volunteers, even though they themselves are volunteers. Uh, and that's free if you signed up by the end of this webinar. So we have the, there's an ebook, we have training video, there's an MP3, a volunteer interest form, an application, interview questions, a recruitment checklist. All of that is part of volunteer recruitment and development. So here's how it all piles up together. All of these modules from Safety Rocket, then recruitment and development, it's total value $793 for you today. Now, if all this did was help you take care of the people you've been entrusted with, would it be worth it? If all this did would help you protect your congregation with the same vigilance you protect your own family, would it be worth it? If all this did was help you fight the reputation of churches that operate without diligence, wisdom, or caution, would it be worth it? If, if churches could lose their reputation of people who think they're outside of the law or that they don't have to you know, work through some of the same stuff that businesses do as far as uh, the way they handle discrimination, as far as the way they uh, keep their facilities safe, as far as the way that they uh, handle human resource issues and the way that they um, you know, make sure that children are protected in every, uh, you know, every sense of the word, like a, like a public elementary school does. We want to be that vigilant as churches to make sure our children are protected. A safe foundation will help you grow without putting your staff or congregation at risk. And you can see why, man, $793 to make sure we are protecting the people um, that are on our staff in our church and our community, our children. That's an incredible deal. And you can jump in today for just $89, $89 over six months. That's safety rocket. So eight, six $89 payments. You can uh, click on the chat stream or you can sign up at safetyrocket.org. We're going to put a link in the chat stream that you can click on. It's 33% off over about the next 10 minutes or so. And I believe that this is an expert church safety staff position for $89. This is the equivalent to 10 people doing months of research um, and implementation to making sure uh, your church is safe. You're gonna go from where you are 
50, 60, 70 yards down the field um, with Safety Rocket in making sure that you're protected. You get started today for $89, safetyrocket.org. You can just file open a new tab and then type in safetyrocket.org or you can look in the chat stream and we'll put a link in there or as I, I spelled it right here, the chat streamer, okay? Yes, you can, you can click on the chat streamer, uh, the link that we're gonna put in there and it's 33% off and also we're gonna throw in that fast action bonus of volunteer recruitment and development and you know our options right now are to just keep doing what we're doing and feeling overwhelmed by, by church safety and looking at it like we do that nagging sound in our car and just ignoring it and hoping it goes away. Or we can take action and go to bed at night with a little more peace and confidence, knowing that we, as the shepherd to the people who are in our congregation, are shepherding them in as many ways as we possibly can, and really wanting to use wisdom in the way that we handle the safety of the people that God has entrusted us with. So safetyrocket.org, it'll explain everything you need to, know, uh, to do from there uh, to get a hold of this in webinar exclusive offer. We'll get to Q&A in a second, but I told you I would share some, uh, some great safety procedures, and I wanna do that real quick. You wanna have a first aid response procedure. We have that in Safety Rocket Module 6, talking through the way uh, to set that up that gives you a lot of peace of mind, um, you know, thinking about if something happens to someone at your church, someone passes out, um, you know, if someone uh, it gets very sick, can you handle that quickly and make sure you're putting people in the right hands, uh, you know, to take care of them as fast as possible. A money handout procedure. A lot of churches have walk-ups, people who ask for money. Um, sometimes they're telling the truth, sometimes they're not. This is just a procedure that helps you navigate all of that. The church money handling procedure. So again, I would, it's unfortunate that we have examples out there of, uh, you know, places where this has been mishandled and churches have been taken advantage of or even stolen from. And this is, you pass around these offering plates. A lot of people put cash in there and then that money is collected. It's counted somewhere. It's given to somebody or it's taken to a bank and deposited. That's a church handling procedure. So you have one, um, but is it the right one? And is it one that protects you? This walks through that. A church violence lockdown procedure walks, uh, kind of walks you through uh, how to handle um, if you know a shooter or an intruder enters into your church property or is outside of your building but on your property with intent to come inside and then emergency procedures like fire evacuation and um, you know unexpected weather procedures like that so I'll come back up here to let you see this again this is uh, safetyrocket.org that's $89 over six months when you jump in today the fast action bonus of the volunteer recruitment and development system uh, while you take a look at that and while you open a new tab and type that in Haley do we have any other questions uh, that have been submitted since we uh, we talked last hey Ben we've got one um, from someone named Ben actually um, yep. And he says, um, he says, at our church, we sometimes have addicts that come into the office bathrooms. They might come in to shower and sometimes even um, do drugs in there. So what are some options to better regulate um, these bathrooms? Yeah, I mean, if that's something that as a church you decided that that's okay, well, that's great. You just want to um, uh, have as limited amount of space as un unlocked as possible. So um, if you've, you know, said we agreed to allow this to be something that our church does. Um, I'm not talking about from a drug standpoint, but if allowing people off the streets to come in, use the bathroom or take a shower, uh, then you just want to have, you know, maybe one bathroom open and then have some subsequent areas around that unlocked. Um, if they're just able to walk up off the streets and that's not something that you want, then you need to think through the, the policy of your, uh, what, what doors are unlocked during office hours uh, at your church. And, and chances may be that you say, well, everybody's here, so all the doors are unlocked, and your staff may need to use, like, you know, a door in the back, and that's the only one that's unlocked. And then, you know, there's some sort of sign that you put by the front door that says, you know, please call this number if you need to get inside. Uh, the people who are there regularly, like, let's say, you know, UPS or people who are delivering things regularly, they're going to learn over time that the back door is unlocked, but people coming up off the streets, uh, aren't going to know that the only door you have unlocked is your back door going to your church offices. 
and um, you know it's going to prevent that from happening. So uh, you know a lot of churches, and I learned through the research of this, they don't uh, they don't lock the doors during office hours, uh, but it's definitely something that you need to think about because. A lot of people see churches as a place that they can either take advantage of or they can manipulate and they can walk into and, you know, have a story about why they need money, create urgency around it, and then guilt you if you don't give them that money immediately saying, well, I thought you loved God and you were doing God's work and you won't give me this money. Um, and some of, that, some of that is just bribery and some of it is fraud, some of it isn't. So Safety Rocket walks you through a way to uh, really kind of identify. It's about asking questions about their background um, it, you know, if they can name names of some, you know, friends, associates, previous jobs, where they live, are they, are they local or are they not local? Um, is there any kind of reference that you can call? Are there any other churches that they've asked for money for? Uh, just the process of being able to look for red flags. Um, but as far as your church during, uh, you know, during work hours, I would lock it down. If this is happening during church services, then I would just employ um, a security team. Again, it could be a volunteer security team of two people. It could be a rotation where on a Sunday, they're going to just be perusing uh, your church and not sitting in the worship service. And then that could rotate and they could be there the next week and you have two other people. And they're really, uh, you know, some walkie talkies so people can say, hey, I think there's something going on in the bathroom. And they could go in together uh, and address that and ask somebody to leave and, you know, make it clear that, that you know, people can't do drugs in your bathroom uh, at, at, at the church. You know, you have people there, you have families and kids there. Um, and if they don't, you know, if they don't respect that, you're going to call the police. So it's a great question. All right. So, Haley, if we have nothing else, it's three o'clock right now. And I want you guys to know you have a few more minutes to go to safetyrocket.org or click on the link in the chat stream. 33% off Safety Rocket. This is six modules and tons of resources, a lot of uh, information that's been compiled and curated and handed to you in an easy to understand way. And you can give it to different volunteers or team members. You can track through it as a staff. And I think you'll find that it's so helpful and creates so much confidence and peace of mind for you uh, when it comes to the way your church is shepherding people and protecting them as they walk in and out of your doors. So again, I appreciate you guys all taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this. I really do encourage you to take a look at safetyrocket.org and that incredible offer that we have for you and really um, put that in play with people who are like me, like I used to be, just not sure where to start, not sure where to go. We're going to have a lot of webinars like this coming up in the future where we share free information for you and love the idea of church leaders coming together, sharing ideas and helping each other um, get better at ministry and love people better. So thank you guys very much, and we'll see you at the next webinar.